Nochmals Grüße aus der Schweiz. Last week, I recorded my first eight-minute episode on my new adventures in Switzerland. I compared the scenic beauty and tranquility of this country, let alone the majesty of the Alps. By the way, in the photo I took from the garden for these YouTube vignettes, I compared those with the sad and turbulent political realities of many countries in the MENA region. I hinted at institutional democracy in a country like Switzerland versus the dyslexic authoritarianism of some rulers in the MENA or Gulf regions. Would the Arab region not become an Elysium too if the political reverberations that destroy many institutions and human rights were extracted from the daily lives of its long-suffering citizens? After 10 days in this confederation and following my first few talks, I still envy the Swiss people for their comfortable realities and nonplussed lives. Yep, the cost of living is exorbitantly high. Taxes are also steep. Eating out could be ruinous. And there is a rule for every single thing. But the system works and many citizens here lead cushy lives when compared even to other European or EU countries. But there is so much one can talk about trees, mountains, lakes, or even clocks, chocolates, fondues, and raclettes. And I love a fondue savoyard, so don't get me wrong. Before the conversations turn dull and boring, ditto, if it is all about rules, regulations, or referenda. Conversely, dull and boring aren't necessarily trademarks I'd use for conversations in the MENA or Gulf regions, where men and women bubble with hot and existential topics to discuss over a cup of coffee or a game of backgammon. Different horses for different courses, you'd tell me. After all, the horse is a metaphor for our world, environment, and life, isn't it? Perhaps. But there is a key difference. In Switzerland, putting aside the larger metropolises of Geneva, Zurich, or the capital Bern, people live their lives in small clusters and spaces and aren't constantly in the eye of the needle like people in the Arab world are, often. Arabs eat, drink, breathe existential issues, which is not always the case for Switzerland or for any other part of, let's say, Nordic Europe. And slowly but surely, this reality, this distinction is sinking into my consciousness as I compare habitats, cultures, and trends. A few days ago, I was in Davos, and my focus was on Israel-Palestine. Now, for most of us, Davos is magical as we watch the World Economic Forum participants assemble in the Congress Center in winter. There's usually plenty of snow, plenty of money, and plenty of fireside chats. And on our screens, it looks otherworldly. But guess what? If the political circumstances were right, this could happen in Lebanon with the same magic and pizzazz. But take away the WEF event or the fancy Belvedere hotel hosting the mightiest and wealthiest from presidents prime ministers and CEOs all the way to the Clooney's of this world, Davos is just a place that's comparable to many Arab towns. So kudos to Switzerland for investing in it. And what a loss that the MENA is too busy turning gold into sawdust because of politics or power grab ideologies. So back to my talks. The responses so far have been largely favorable 
to my themes, thankfully. I suppose the recent incursion by the Israeli army of Jenin refugee camp has left a bitter taste in people's mouths, even those who salivate over Israeli politics usually. So had the shameful eviction of the Sobloban family from their 40-year-old home in Jerusalem, just so religious settlers can colonize their house. How would you feel if someone came and kicked you out of your own home? Mind you, I think, I sense that many fair-minded peoples, even in Europe and the USA, are beginning to realize the dizzying levels of impunity, apartheid, and crassness applied by Israeli successive governments against Palestinians. Even those advocating the two-state solution are doing it merely to keep the conflict at bay and to keep Israel at times happy. As for the normalizing countries, well, their interests are patently economic and perhaps even military, not necessarily Palestine friendly. As I've often said, words are fine, but deeds are what change realities on the ground. I understand that Palestinians of all factions are meant to meet in Cairo end month to discuss the future of intra-Palestinian relations, as well as the excesses of the Israeli occupying behemoth. Can I recommend to them that they manage, they strive to find common ground, reconcile their differences, and realize that they're all being played for fools by outside forces? Will they wake up or will they continue swallowing their political amphetamines and continue their different roles as subcontractors to a vicious occupation? Socrates is quoted as saying that to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. So I stop here for today and leave it to you to draw your own knowledgeable and wise conclusions. Nochmals Grüße aus der Schweiz.